and welcome to Highland Showcase, bringing you a snapshot of life in the Highlands of Scotland. Today we're here at Fern Farm where we're going to meet John Scott, who's going to join us throughout the series and teach us a bit about life on the farm. But first of all, let's take a look at what's in this week's show. Coming up on this week's show, we make our first visit of the year to Fern Farm, where we catch up with farmer John Scott. Colin's driving skills are put to the test when he gets behind the wheel at Skidcar Scotland. I'm in Migdale and Ledwell Woods, where the Woodland Trust are taking horse logging back into the forest. And we take a look behind the scenes at Ross Sutherland, which is more than just a rugby club. Welcome to Fern Farm. I'm delighted you're joining us. Over the next year, we're going to take you on a journey. The journey is going to involve loads of characters, be it four-legged, like the sheep behind us, or even these two, Pip and Jess. We'll introduce you to the family, the children, James, Izzy, Lexi and Archie, Mum and Dad, and Fiona, my wife. We've farmed at Fern now for over a hundred years. I'm the fourth generation to be here. Hopefully one of the kids will take it on and be the fifth. It's a great way of life. We really enjoy it, but it is tough at times. We've got to deal with the weather and that can really cause problems throughout the year, as you'll see. But with the bad times come the good times. And without the bad times, you don't really appreciate the good times. So it should be interesting, it should be fun. And I hope you enjoy it. Furnace was described as a lowland mixed farm. The lowland bit gives it away really. Our highest point is only 50 feet above sea level. Mixed means we've got various different enterprises, beef, sheep and cereals. And I'm going to tell you more about them over the coming months. I've mentioned already that I'm the fourth generation to farm here. This is a good opportunity to bring in James Scott, the third generation. We try and catch up as often as we can, but with a busy business, um, it's often hard to find time. Um, we do rely on each other, knowing what each other is doing and having to work almost telepathically. That sometimes breaks down though, and uh, we need to revisit things. Today we're a wee bit concerned about ground conditions. It's been very wet recently, and uh, Dad's pointed out an issue in one of the fields we need to have a look at. Yeah, that this double turnip field down there is um, not going to be fit for sheep to go onto at the moment. Um, do you think I should be snacking these ones and giving them a wee bit of concentrate? Possibly, yes. These are sheep that are due to lamb middle of March and it's very important that they have a dry bed to lie on. We've got stubble turnips there for them, but because the, the ground next to the stubble turnips is so wet, we're going to have to keep them on a drier field. So it's very important for the development of the foetus that they get the adequate nutrients at this stage in pregnancy. So what Dad's suggesting is a great idea. We're going to start giving them a bit of homegrown barley, some bought beet pulp and dark cranes, just to give them a bit of a boost on this important lead up to lambing. I wish you'd say some of my ideas were great more often. <laughs> <laughs> just keep them coming and we'll pick out the good ones. <laughs> it's very important. Um, one of the big issues in a, in a family farm is the the communication between generations, and I'm not saying we get it right all the time, but we do make an effort. Um, it can also be a, a, a point of controversy is that handing over family farm from one generation to another, but we're, we're working hard at it and we'll hopefully find a, a solution and something we can work towards in the future. We do have monthly meet meetings where the four of us, our wives and ourselves, sit down. The wives are there to keep um, John and I civil 
but uh, it, that's an area where we can talk about more controversial things and seem to be able to do it quite easily. Yeah. There are four of us in the family farming partnership, um, as Dad mentioned, both our wives and ourselves. Uh, at some stage in the future we'll look to take in the next generation, but that's a few years away yet. So guys, these are good examples of um, the Beltex breed that we breed in the farm. We breed these sheep for their, for their muscling. You can see the muscling starting to come in that lamb already. It's only a, a few days old. And these will be, well, this one's a, a little boy. What do you call him again? Trooper. Trooper. So he'll be sold for, to someone else who then use him to produce lambs for, um, for, for eating. This little guy won't get eaten though. He's going to be a, a show star. Look at him, he's standing already. We take some of these Beltex to local shows. We really enjoy it. It's good fun. It's a good way of meeting people and getting out in the summer. Here's mum. These guys were actually in embryo transfers. What we've done is we've, we've flushed embryos out of some of our best use, best pure Beltex use, and popped them into this girl here. This is a lovely New Zealand Suffolk cross you. She's a real cracker. Nice and big and long and strong. And she's got loads of milk. As you can see, she's making a very good job of these lambs. So hopefully these guys will make it to the summer shows and win some prizes. Off you go, Tilly. Now they're off for a sack from mum. Very important at this stage that we get enough feed into these ewes. We've given them hay, we give them turnips. We also give them um, compound feed so they've got enough milk and protein to produce them. Um, enough food to produce milk for the lambs. Um, at this stage, the lambs are solely dependent on the mums for milk. They don't eat grass yet, and won't be till they're two, three weeks old, till they're outside, where they'll actually start eating grass and a little bit of compound feed themselves. guys, one of the really important things about looking after sheep when they're just lambed is uh, making sure they've got everything they need. They're in a small pen as you can see, they can't uh, forage outside and uh, get what they need in from grass etc at this time of year. So we've got to make sure, first of all, the pen's nicely bedded, so we use this barley straw, <clears throat> nice and dry, gives them a, a good bedding, we we'll make sure they're fed. and. Um, Critical part to this operation is, well, one of the main ingredients, the main ingredient in, uh, in milk is water. So we've got to make sure they've always got a, a clean supply of water um, so they can produce milk for these uh, lovely little lambs. Little Beltex lamb there. Little girl, just uh, a few hours old, about 12, 14 hours old. She's not the biggest little girl in the world, but we keep this water coming. She'll, uh, her mum will produce lots of milk and maybe she'll grow. So these little girls will be in here for oh, 48 hours and then we'll put a rubber ring on her tail. Um, just so her tail's a bit shorter. It means she'll be cleaner in life. And uh, they'll move out into a bigger pen where they can um, stretch their legs and get used to being out in the open with other sheep. And eventually they'll move outside and onto grass. Um, and that's another very important part on their growth is making sure they've got adequate grass and shelter outside and go big and strong. So we're busy in the lambing shed and all of our ewes, we hope, will have good lambs. What we do before lambing time is we scan them. So I can tell from this ewe that she's got a red dot on her, she's going to have triplets and she has. She had three little Beltex lambs. But the reason we scan is so we know how many lambs are coming. It's important to do that, for example, if a ewe's having a single, we want to feed her a wee bit less because we don't get, want the lamb to get too big. <coughs> Ideally, all the ewes would have pairs. That would be an ideal world. But it doesn't happen like that. So what we'll do here is, we'll leave this ewe with two lambs. And when we have another ewe has a single lamb, we'll try and foster this lamb onto her. Because a ewe's got two teats, she's got two sides for a lamb to, to feed from, which makes it a bit difficult for three. So this little fella, this little boy will get a new mum soon, when we get a chance. 
Unfortunately, sometimes use lose lambs, i.e. they're born, stillborn or slipped or for some reason they die. In that sort of situation, we take two orphan lambs and try and introduce them to the new mother. Sometimes they take them straight away, sometimes they don't. We have various different methods we use to get the new lambs to take their new mum and vice versa, one of which is we'll either hand rear it on a bottle, or I, most of the time what we'll do is try and foster it onto you with only one lamb so that she goes out of the shed with two. Unfortunately, sometimes you lose lambs for various different reasons. And in that situation, we'd foster two lambs on. So she, again, she goes out of the shed with two lambs. This little fellow's looking for a new mum. Although this mum's pretty keen on him. So, little chap, next time we get a chance, we'll get you fostered on. Well, winter's definitely upon us, and out in the Highlands, we're going to be encountering all sorts of different road conditions. But how many of us would know what to do if we got into difficulty and maybe gone into a skid? Well, I'm here at Milltown near Elgin with Skid Car Scotland, and I'm meeting with my instructor, Bill McLennan, who's going to take me through my paces and show me exactly what we need to do. Bill, tell us a little bit about the course that we're going to be doing today. Well, it's all about grip and not slip. It's all about front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, and how the vehicle affects you for, for different types of vehicles you're driving. Fantastic. And you and train all sorts of different people here, don't you? We, tra we train all different people. We uh, train the police, ambulance service, the general public, and companies. And you've been going for how long? We've been going for 20 years. And the only company in Scotland We're doing this? We're the only uh, qualified instructors in Scotland in Skidcar. And I understand that there are some co countries in Europe that this course is compulsory for people. Yes, yeah, Sweden, Austria, Finland and uh, Norway. Um, you would not be, be allowed to sit a basic driving test um, without having a certificate in, in Sweden. That's amazing. Well, I, I'm really looking forward to it and uh, I hope you're going to not be too embarrassed at my level of driving. But I think you should crack on and, uh, and you can okay. take me through my paces. Yep. Excellent. Okay. So if I can get you cool Go into side. the side call, right. yeah, please. <coughs> So what's the first thing we're going to look at then, Bill? The very first thing you're going to look at is the type of vehicle you're driving. Right. Bit, front wheel drive, um, it's the first thing you should know, what type of vehicle you're driving, because they've all got their own differences. I'm going to take you through rear wheel drive first. Mm -hmm. the, the, the equipment itself gives you all different road conditions, from dry roads to wet roads to the slush, um, compact snow, ice, right. sheet ice, uh -huh. and sheet ice with powder, dry powder snow. Wow, so you can simulate everything you can, yeah. That's fantastic. Right, so the first thing you're going to show me is um, rear wheel drive. Rear wheel right? drive in a skid situation, and the only chance you've got coming out of it is to take away the drive force. Yeah. And the quickest way to take away the drive force is to declutch. Right. And if you're in an automatic, they can end in you. Okay. So when you recognise a skid, or you feel, feel the, industry, uh, the oversteer coming in, yeah. is get the clutch in, keeping the clutch in, straightening your wheel, right. and then taking the steering back, once you get your inches, uh, your, um, your traction back, yeah. you marry your range of speed to your road speed and bring the clutch back up nice and gently. Right, okay. So if you watch what I'm doing here, it's, you don't want to get the way in the back uh -huh. there. Now the camber on the road is about the centre of the road. Uh -huh. So you have clutch in and then yeah. correcting the, now, the steering wheel. If I didn't push on the clutch, at the moment it's on compact snow. Uh -huh. So if I don't push on the clutch, you'll see what will happen. Yes, you don't want to be doing that. So yeah, yeah, because the drive is there and you're getting pushed further and further into the skid. Yeah. Um, so what you're going to do is take away the drive. Okay. But so this it? is an extreme oversteer then we're looking at here. Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah. The biggest problem is so when people come off a bend like it is here, come off. You, they, they come off, they come round the bend, and they think they'll come, they've managed to come round quite safely. But then, between this and the next part, okay, with the turn off, they'll accelerate up a bit. It's a speed and approach that sends you away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they'll build up again, and then they'll come off the gas. Uh -huh. And this is it without using a clutch. <laughs>
Join us after the break where we see how Colin got on with his driving. We look back at last year's first ever Highland On Farm Ram Sale with John at Fern Farm. We meet Eleanor Garty and find out more about the Woodland Trust. Just did completely did the wrong opposite thing, didn't you? Yeah, well, feet off. As long as the dry force is there, you can be forced yeah. further, further into the skin. Yeah. That's funny, I just completely did the wrong thing there. Right. So you can see you've got to have your speed down. Yeah. Even with the clutch in, it's just wanting to go, isn't it? Yeah, it's. um. It's all about getting the speed down. Yeah. You've got to think you're sitting in four pieces of rubber the size of the sole of your shoe. Yeah, that's and true. That's between yeah. heaven and hell or whatever you're going. Yeah, it's dry. It's dry force for the car. Yeah. It forces it, yeah. So it's a lot more difficult to control. Yeah, so don't use the clutch at all. Yeah, my feet's are. secret is, when you come onto your bend, get the clutch in before it's so the dry force is taken away. Yeah, right. Now we're going to put a little bit of dry powder snow on top of the... Oh, totally nice. <laughs> and you can see at the moment you're doing three to four miles an hour. Uh -huh. And you're travelling so you're not needing any pulling power. Yeah. Or pushing power in this case. Yeah. Um, you just get the clutch in and keep the clutch in. Right. Yeah. When you turn off, it's when you're going to lose it. So you just gently turn off because it's on the sloppy surface at yeah. the moment. And then we'll just speed up in a straight line up to the to the top one. Yeah. And turn. Like and then turn in and then just clutch in. And, and, and take a steering just, back to straight. Right. And then just hold it. Yeah. And it works weight. Normal reaction is when it's loose, it's to try and take it back and yeah. fight it back and forth. And that's when you lose it and that's when the danger lies. Yeah. Right. Hold it, hold it, speed up. Hold it up, don't try to bring it up. And you turn off. Turn on? Yeah. When you pull forward, you're going to miss it. You're going to go in there. Yeah. Yeah, it's good, see. You try that again? Yeah. Yeah, 
but you hopefully you won't get to that stage. Aqua Clean is a very, very dangerous thing. It usually ends up in a serious injury or fatality. The first signs of aquaplaning is the steering wheel light and the engine revs. That's the only two things. If you have a rev counter, mm -hmm. you see that coming up. Right. Things that can cause you to go completely out of control is harsh acceleration, coarse steering, changing gear, mm -hmm. touching the brakes, or simply lifting your foot off the gas and getting engine braking. Right. Another factor is a small pebble lying on the road. Mm -hmm. And you must never touch the brakes. Right. Well, it's been a really excellent day and a really informative one as well and it's taught me a lot of things about how to drive on our winter roads but if it's taught me one thing it's to keep my speed under control and also to always remember that you're really just riding on four small bits of rubber the size of the sole of your shoe it's been a fantastic day and thanks to Bill and Skid Car Scotland and I really would recommend that everybody does this course if they can do Diversification, very much a buzzword within the farming community, and the Scots from Fern Farm are generally at the forefront of the Highland movement. Well, this is our first uh, on-farm ram sale. We're calling it Great from Grass. All the rams have been grass-fed with no extra feed. Um, we've got about 60 rams to sell. It's the first time we've, sent, we've done it. We've been uh, thinking about it for quite a while. There, there are two other people who have done it in Scotland, but we're the first in the Highlands. So the breeds we have for sale today are Texel, New Zealand Suffolk, Easy Care, Beltex, and there's one Charlie. We also have teaser rams, which um, are at a fixed price. The local auction mark, Dingwall and Highland Market, are um, conducting the sale for us. Um, so, yeah, quite nervous, but uh, looking forward to it at the same time. So why have it on the farm? The benefit of having it on the farm for us is that we don't have to traipse around different auction centres um, selling our rams. We can cut down on fuel bills. It's also easier for the rams. They come out of their field into the shed that they know and they're sold into somebody else's stock trailer and straight to their um, farm. So it's less stress on them. Um, it's just easier. We can just feed them grass out the field and off they go to the new home. And in theory, if we feed them less concentrates, they would have concentrates through the winter, obviously, but now they're just off grass. They, um, they'll last for longer. So instead of maybe lasting for two or three years, which some rams do, these guys should last five or six years and maybe more. 
and you have people coming from all over to, to the sale. Yeah, the furthest we've got today that I know of um, are two gentlemen who travelled travel up from Yorkshire. They left at five this morning and arrived here uh, for a sale that starts at six o'clock. So they've made quite an effort to get here. With the rain, as you can maybe hear, all the local people should be here as well. And, and hopefully that's where a lot of our taps will go. But I suspect there'll be buyers from Caithness and Elgin and um, there are there's some from further south in Scotland too. So we don't really mind where they come from as long as we, we sell these rams and uh, get them away at fairly good prices. Rod, can you tell us what the Scottish sheep strategy is all about? Yes, the, it's about trying to encourage commercial farmers to use performance records to help them increase the, pro the profitability and the productivity of their flock. For many years they had no option but to, to buy their breeding stock on visual appearance only. And there are so many other things which are critical to the, the financial success of an industry that they actually can't see. So, so what we have done is we've used the, the estimated breeding values which are scientifically worked out on particular traits, growth, muscle depth and maternal ability. Those are the three really meaningful ones for, for the profitability of the sheep farmer. And we've got a perfect example here today now, John and, or James and John Scott have been doing this for a number of years and they've got sheep and they can sell them to the general public with a guarantee. It's the same as you buying a car and you know because the manufacturer tells you it's 250 horsepower or it's 180 horsepower. That's what we're doing now before folk only looked at it and think, gosh, I think that'll be 250 horsepower because it looks it. But you don't buy a car because it's red. You buy a car because you know a bit about it. So what we're trying to do is looking at the scientific part of it to say that this sheep has got a very good chance of passing on the genes which will give you bigger lambs or heavier lambs or musclier lambs or its mother, its daughters will give you more lambs. And it's just as simple as that. And we're encouraging these on-farm sales of performance recorded sheep too and it's, it's great to see the first sale that we've got in the north with the Scots here in Fern and doing that. If you think of forestry management today, you think of big machines that can cut trees down in 30 seconds. But what if the land isn't fit for that? Well, we're here at Ledmore and Midvale Forest to find out more. Okay, Eleanor, this is a site of special scientific interest. Can That's you right. tell us why that is? Well, this is Migdale Pinewood. It's a site of special scientific interest because it's an ancient pine wood. Um, it has a tremendous complexity of species and habitats, right from the very tiny to the very big. So we've got things like um, very special lichens. We've got very special pine wood sawflies, which tell us that perhaps this woodland is related back to woodlands from the post ice age period. We've got slave maker ants that put other ants to work. And then as you start to move up the scale, we've got things like Scottish crossbill. Um, we have ospreys. We have peregrine falcons and of course we have red and roe deer here as well. So what is it the Woodland Trust are, are trying to preserve here? It's really this tremendous biological diversity. Um, we know about a lot of it but there's a lot of it we just don't know about. So it's really important to keep it intact and keep the integrity of this very special landscape. And the Woodland Trust as a whole are trying to um Maybe invite the public in and enjoy the woods a little bit Very more. Very much so. Um, I mean, a woodland that's valued is a woodland that stays. And um, we're very much encouraging people to come and enjoy. Um, here at Ledmore and Migdale over the last few years, we've had a programme of, of events and activities, particularly focusing on children and encouraging them to come in and get to know the woods, get to love them, and then perhaps look after them when they're older. And today was something a little bit different with the, the horse logging. It's a bit special today, yes. Um, what we're doing is working with Scottish Natural Heritage um, to try and return this woodland to a very native composition, a more native composition than it has now. There are a few alien interlopers at the moment, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you have non-native species that are perhaps more successful than the native species that are already here, you need to take some management action to deal with that. So what we're doing is we're felling some of the non-native trees, particularly larch today, and we're taking them out with a horse. 
And the reason that we're doing this is because if you bring in forest machinery, even if you're as careful as you can be, it's still quite invasive and um, you can get compaction of the soil. You can lose some of the special ground flora. But a horse is a much lighter intervention. Um, it doesn't disturb the soil nearly so much. And in fact, even when you're pulling out a log, it does create a little bit of surface disturbance, but that can actually spread plants and, and bring new colonies of plants to different parts of the wood. And here it's particularly important because we have this very special orchid called the Creeping Lady's Tresses. And it's one of the few British orchids that you only get in, mostly in Scotland. It goes into Northern England as well. And it's, it's nationally scarce. It is declining, although we are very lucky to have quite a lot of it here. But nonetheless, it's, it's very important that we look after it. So having the horse in here will, will help keep that orchid safe. And, and I'm sorry we can't show it to you today, it only flowers in the summer. But when it's here, it's, it's not very spectacular, but it's very special when you look at it close up. Because you can see why it's called ladies' tresses. Each of the flower spikes are little creamy white flower spikes. And each of the flower spikes, the flowers are arranged in a kind of spiral up the spike. And when you look at it closely, it looks like a, a braided tress of blonde hair, hence the name. Join us in part three, where we're back in the woods at Migdale with Tarzan and his handler Brian Green. And we go behind the scenes at Ross Sutherland Rugby Club to see if they live up to their name as the most friendliest club in the north. Brian, can you tell us how you got into horse logging? Well, I was a deer stalker most of my life and I gave it up two years ago just wanting to find something different to do and I went on a horse logging course and from then on I really wanted to do that. Um, I had a couple of young horses of my own which I was uh, training for firewood um, but then I got a contract with the Forest Commission to pull out some timber and decided to go for a a proper horse that was capable of the bigger timber. And what breed of horse is Tarzan? He's a Comtois, which is a French breed. Uh, I went over to Belgium and France to look at various horses and went for him. So shall we uh, go and tuck him up ready for the job? Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, Brian, what are we tucking up with here? Well, we've got the collar and the pad and the harness. Okay. <coughs> that just gives some more cushioning and absorbs the sweat. Give more comfort. Now where does the, the collar and the equipment actually come from? Well most of the equipment nowadays comes from America, from the Amish people who still work horses. Put this harness on. Yeah, the harness obviously just spreads the roof of the bike. Yes, bike, yes, that's right. a lot of trust between yourself and the horse even though oh, yes. you've only had him for a short time. You have to trust your horse. <laughs> mm. You're when you stay close to them anyway. <coughs> so that's the harness on. And we attach the chains now for the logs. And this, uh, this is the uh, attaches to the, the hems and collar to pull the log on. Okay. And finally, we'll put on the bit. Thank you. 
hier. So that's him tacked up, ready to go. Horse logging is said to be a viable and sustainable industry for the 21st century, benefiting the woodlands and horses, keeping traditional and important skills alive. Horses can offer a flexible answer to a range of access problems. Horse loggers perform other important services in the forest, controlling bracken, brambles and other invasive weeds, scarifying to encourage natural regeneration, moving fencing materials, tools and equipment, as well as working in the establishment. Horse loggers work through the whole range of timber produced in British woodlands, from small coppice poles and firewood, through to thinnings in soft and hardwoods, right up to final crop, large saw logs in soft and hardwood. Horses can extract timber effectively and safely through standing timber without causing any damage to the standing crop, compacting soil or causing damage or disturbance to the flora and fauna. Ross Sutherland Rugby Club are based in Invergordon and have one of the finest pitches in the north of Scotland. The most famous player to have pulled on a stag shirt was Duncan McRae, who went on to play for Scotland and the British Lions. We went along to see if they lived up to their name as the friendliest club in the north of Scotland. Ross Sutherland's been in existence for 85 years now. We've got the largest catchment area of any club in the UK, any rugby club in the UK. Our area stretches from, we've got guys travelling from Nairn in the east, across to Adelpool and Gearlock in the west, and as far north as Helmsdale. Um, it's a great club. It's very much focused on not just rugby, but on the social side of things as well, and, and what playing rugby can do for people, um, especially in a rural area. Uh, a lot of our guys travel quite a bit to get here. And they lead fairly lonely existence where they work, especially in the senior, the senior players. 
Um, so getting to the rugby club is quite social for them. And the youth level, we've got guys from all over again. And it's about playing sport, but it's not just about playing sport, it's about giving kids the skills that are required for going to later life. Um, you know, um, just giving them confidence. We work with all different shapes and sizes. It doesn't matter on ability, whether you're a real athlete or whether you're just maybe challenged a wee bit in the sporting side of things. As long as you're coming along and enjoying yourself, there's a role for you here at every level, from, from kids right the way through to adults. On the senior side of things, we've had quite a lot of non-playing members that are involved in running the club. Uh, the club is run by committee. We've got a junior committee that handles the junior club and the senior committee. And then we get together for the overall committee and, and, and steer the club in the direction we want to go in, uh, which is getting more and more people, not just playing rugby, but involved in the, in the social aspect as well. Now, the, you're involved yourself in the, the junior side. Yeah, I first uh, got involved with Rutherland 22 years ago when I was 16. Started coming along and there was no youth section at that stage, so I played second team rugby and gradually um, got into first team rugby. And throughout the years, I've held the post of captain and president, and now I'm mini coordinator and I, and I coach the junior side. Um, this is the first time I've coached juniors, and I used to coach seniors. It's a, it's a different, uh, different coaching technique, but uh, it's really great. I get a lot out of it um, when you take. Uh, I coach the primary six, sevens. You take them away to a festival and watch them um, improve and win games, and just seeing them loving the game and getting stuck in. And as you said, that is what Ross Sutherland is all about. It's very much about having fun, meeting people, giving people confidence and skills for life, and um, yeah, just getting out there, playing the sport, keeping fit. That's that's also a very important part of rugby, is um, especially people that are like myself when I was playing. I wasn't naturally fit. I had to work hard to become fit and, and keep fit. And it's great that, that, that people come along and get involved and, and become fit. This is a healthy, healthy option. We, we, we encourage people to train a little bit on their own. We'll give kids and uh, players advice and diet, um, what they should be eating to maximise performance. And Yeah, there's a, there's a real support network there. And I've met a lot of friends over the years being involved here, and you can see already these kids that are... Um, and even the micros, we have guys turn up from primary one to three, which are called micros, just little tooty guys, boys and girls, and they um, they don't play contact, but they're just making friends for life straight away. And they progress into primary four and five, and there's contact then, and six and seven, the, the same. And then once they get into the academy, it, it starts to become, you know, there's more members in a team, and eventually they work up to full 15 aside matches. Um, but yeah, it's about meeting people and the contact and the friends for life. and. Um, I've had a great journey so far with Ross Sutherland and looking forward to, the, to another few exciting years as well. At the moment, as you can see around us, we've just put floodlights in. They're not on just now, but um, you know, we spent a lot of money getting the floodlights in. We're going to get the car park sorted out. A few years ago, we extended the clubhouse and we're now um, going to employ a full-time de development officer. Um, John Mann's here. So it's quite exciting. His role will be able to will be to spread the word and get out there into the community and, and get more and more people, especially kids, involved in playing the game. Currently my role is to go into all the schools in the Ross and Sutherland area and it's to do just fun and active sessions for kids aged primary one all the way to the end of secondary school with the aim of getting them playing rugby and coming down to the club. So you actually take sessions within the school itself? Yep, I go in for curriculum time classes and I also set up after schools where I'm head coach and take all the sessions. And have you seen quite a, a big uptake on these? Yeah, well I've been working for the club for two years now and um, you know, kids have, there's over 100 kids here on a Saturday morning when there used to be maybe 60, 70 so there is an increase and it's still growing now so it's looking good. And the aim is to get all the kids here, because this is the, the sole club for Rossshire area, Ross and Sutherland. But last year I was coaching from Fort Rose all the way up to Bonerbridge, so it's quite a big area I've been covering. And this year I'm aiming to take it further out, going into Dingwall, maybe a bit further out that way, up into Sutherland, Laird. So it's more just trying to increase rugby to more kids and give everyone a shot. Of the club has been moving uh, forward over the last few years, so uh, there's quite a lot of ambition at the club. And uh, you'll see all around you brand new floodlights, and inside the clubhouse we've got brand new uh, shower rooms and boilers, and we're about to start work on the car park. Uh, we've raised about £75,000 to do all that work, which for a small club is uh, quite impressive. 
and we're in the black. We, we have no debt after doing all that work. We're, we're running the club uh, from the, we've started five-year-olds this year at Micros and we're going all the way up to under 18s, under 16 team, and they're doing very well. They're very enthusiastic and uh, we're knocking them into shape. They're doing well on the field. So I'm quite pleased with that. Um, the club in general, it, the uh, the seniors, uh, the num we've been recruiting quite a lot of new players, but uh, unfortunately you do get uh, players who retire or leave the area. So uh, our num overall numbers have not really been going up, although we have a, a big influx of uh, new players coming in. The team is very young, so the prospects are very good. Um, the results haven't been great this season. Uh, last season they were very good. We, several times we've reached the semi-final of a national cup in Scotland. So, uh, you know, we have the uh, potential to do really well and we, we'd like to go one better. Um, so this season hasn't been as well as we'd expected, but with a young team and with a very good coach in Rob, uh, Rob Parks, we, uh, we have every... Um, uh, we, we have every expectation to do much better next season and we also expect to finish the season well uh, but we've, we've got a really uh, good uh, junior committee a lot of new members have come in and that's doing that's going well we have a senior committee who are working very hard as you as no doubt you'll tell from all the work that's going on off the field and uh, the Sun is shining today and uh, everything is wonderful <laughs> the end <laughs> Coming up on next week's show, I am in Aberlauer for the opening of the salmon fishing season on the River Spey. I try my hand at fly fishing at Karen. Mimi meets three talented designer sisters from Advi, and I meet Jim Walker, managing director of Walker Shortbread.